This is kind of a new thing for me. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to... Uh, they're interfering with one another, aren't they? Are we okay? Alright, there we go. Can you hear me alright? Yeah, perfect, okay. Um, so I, I, recently, I recently came out, um, not as a homosexual, because I think my mother knew that for quite some time. Um, but I, I recently came out as somebody sort of flirting with what you guys have been into for, for a while. Um, partly because most of what I talk about at co uh, in colleges as part of my dangerous faggot tour um, are, <laughs> is uh, free speech and the encroachment on free speech and on education, on liberty, on um, uh, intellectual freedom and on freedom on the internet to do what you want and say what you want, um, explore the ideas that you like from the progressive left, from, um, from sort of big, big state uh, leftists. And I worry them a little bit because I'm a homosexual, but I don't follow the normal rules. Um, I've never really understood why just because I like sucking dick, uh, I should automatically want the state to take 75% of my earnings and spend it on whatever they like. Um, I've never really understood why just because I like to watch RuPaul's Drag Race, that automatically means that I'm in favor of scrapping nuclear deterrence and various other, other sort of crazy leftist things. Um, now, some of you will have views on the nuclear thing, but we'll get to that later. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit today about free speech and education, and in particular, feminism. I want to talk to you about feminism as gay guy, I've kind of got license to be rude about this in a way that many of you haven't. If you want to, you know, save your marriages, not get estranged from your daughters. Um, so I'll talk you through a little bit how um, I see feminism as a sort of attack vector for the large state progressive left. And it's perhaps one of the largest threats to liberty, um, intellectual freedom and physical freedom now. Um, that there is out there in, in, um, in America and elsewhere in the world. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit of, uh, through some stuff that's been happening on university campuses recently, and then we'll get quickly onto the Q&A, because it's, uh, I think that's what everybody finds most, most interesting. Um, so, well, I'll tell you first of all what's been happening to me the last couple of weeks. Uh, I spoke at Rutgers University, and I was speaking about intellectual freedom, I was speaking about, you know, sort of dissident alternative internet movements, and movements empowered by the internet, like yours. Um, and I like to go to colleges and to, to make the case for full, unabridged intellectual, academic, and, and, uh, and uh, creative freedom for people to be able to say and do what they want, interrogate new ideas without worrying about consequence, to be able to meet new people and to um, explore whatever ideas they want, however dangerous. But um, this is met by a current, a current in um, culture at the moment from the progressive left. Uh, which is profoundly hostile, antithetical to free speech and free inquiry. And I was sort of giving a speech like this, and at one point a, a feminist at Black Lives Matter protester stood up, smeared her face in red paint and said, this man preaches hatred! <laughs> and I was a bit taken aback, because all, all I think I'd said was, um, it'd be quite a nice idea if universities taught people the full range of opinions. Uh, and so, <laughs> What I, what I realized when I got invitation to, to this thing is, is that I've been missing something about feminism which I, which I dislike so much. And I've been missing that it is, um, at least these kids of course are all very ill-educated and stupid people, but um, they're, all, they're also people who are primed to be clamped to the public teeth later in life. They are people who have careers ahead of them, leeching off tax dollars, um, will very, very rarely be any kind of productive member of society at all, uh, and are most likely to end up you know, working for the government, working for charities, you name it. Um, and there's a sort of, there's a respect in which the modern sort of feminist movement, which basically is, is tearing men and women apart and um, is a sort of horrible sociopathic and dreadful um, sort of, of bigotry. There's a, a, a respect in which it's actually just another, as I said earlier, sort of attack vector for the large state liberal left. Now, um, I'll talk you through a little bit of the, some of the sort of excesses of it, and then we should get we should get into Q and A because it, it, it's, it's interesting just to have a chat about these things. Um, let me just find. I had an interesting example. Yeah, a couple, a couple of interesting things that, that um, this is one of the ways in which the state sort of insinuates its way into uh, the media with the help of kind of advocacy research at universities. Anyone here heard of the wage gap? Yeah, you've heard of that. Does anyone believe the wage gap? Does anyone here think women are paid less than men? Uh, Good, no idiots. Um, have you heard of campus rape culture? Have you heard of that? 
You heard of that? Yeah, a few people. Does anyone believe that there is a culture of rape on American campuses that rewards rapists? No, no good. No idiots. This is a very good audience. Right. Um, <laughs> most, most of the time when you ask these questions, uh, when not explicitly talking to people you know are going to agree with you already, um, you'll find that people believe things like women are paid less than men. Well, they're not. Um, this confuses wages with earnings. If you take all the money that men earn and all the money that women earn and do a simple division, um, you'll get something like 75 or 77 cents to the dollar. Um, but that's earnings, not wages. And the amount, the reason that women earn a little bit less, they have babies and they make different life choices. This is used sort of slyly to insinuate that a woman for the same work will get 77 cents, uh, 77 cents to the dollar. Um, <coughs> Uh, but, you know, just, just going out in her, in her salary packet, that's of course not true. Why do they do it? Well, they do it to um, justify the engorgement of the state. They do it to justify enlarging the remit of programs that are designed to help women. Now, as a homosexual, I don't care too much about pregnancy, but I am nonetheless expected to subsidize it uh, by paying way more into the tax system as a man and taking far less out because I die earlier, I don't get sick as much, and I work much harder than the average woman. Um, and that holds right away across society. Um, the campus rape culture, again, is another respect in which the state is trying to sort of infiltrate itself, not, in a, not into our economic lives, but into our personal lives and into our sex lives. Most people um, believe the majority of what they read in the newspapers. They believe that there is a campus rape epidemic on American campuses. They think that uh, women are four to, uh, whatever, one in every four women or one in every five women, depending on what bonkers activist Obama's been listening to that day. Um, really, they believe that um, you know, these women are, are, are at risk of being assaulted on campuses. Well, they're not. In order to believe that, you'd have to believe that American campuses, of course run by liberals, uh, have higher rates of sexual assault than the Congo, where rape is used as a weapon of war. Um, you know, this stuff is nonsense. Why do they do it? Well, they do it to engorge the remit of services paid for by your taxes that are designed to make women feel good about themselves. Now, all of this so far sounds slightly misogynistic, or at least has an air of it, but I don't think it does. Um, this stuff hurts men and women, and it's an example of what happens when the state runs amok. It's an example of what happens when the state breaks the bounds even of, of what is supposedly a relatively sensible, confined uh, constitutional provision in the United States and starts injecting itself into, um, into people's personal, financial, and even spiritual lives. Now, I haven't take, entirely, completely taken the plunge with you guys yet, um, but I'm being pushed in that direction by a variety of things that I'm researching at the moment to do with uh, free speech and sexual politics and education on American campuses. It does seem to be the case that in all of these uh, examples, the government doesn't just poison everything that it touches, but it makes, um, it makes messing up really, really expensive. I mean, it messes up really expensively uh, in every way, and in, in every matter that it touches. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, I'll, take, I'll talk to you through briefly through a case that I found very chilling, an example of state overreach, um, presence of a state where it shouldn't exist, which I found quite shocking. Um, has anyone here heard of Gregory Allen Elliott, that case in Canada? Yeah. So uh, some of you will know what this is. Gregory Allen Elliott, a guy in Canada, um, he's, you know, nice guy, tweets a bit weirdly, a um, bit of an eccentric, but he was put on a criminal trial in Canada for disagreeing with and mocking feminists on the internet. Um, and this wasn't just a case of him, you know, having his Twitter account suspended or unverified or whatever. He was actually taken in Canada to a criminal trial um, because he disagreed with and mocked feminists on the internet. And now this is part of uh, the various different constituents, the various different uh, uh, steps on the way to him being in front of the judge, in front of the crown, as they call it in Canada, um, with his liberty at stake with the state effectively saying, these are the sorts of speech that you are allowed to do, and these are the people you're allowed to disagree with, or we will incarcerate you. The steps that it took to get him there, I think are quite instructive, and they show just how far the reaches of the state have gone um, in debate in the public square, which as a journalist is what I'm principally concerned with. So, first of all, he argues with the feminists on the internet, and then that feminist starts complaining to the abuse and harassment um, uh, staff at social networks. These people in the social networks themselves are progressive big statists. Um, and they're very closely connected with government, of course. You know, you've probably have seen in, uh, in Germany, Facebook has uh, agreed that Angela Merkel can effectively tell them 
what sorts of opinions are acceptable in Germany to post on social media. So for instance, uh, Germans are having some misgivings about 1.2 million Syri Syrian immigrants coming into the country, um, and those sorts of opinions are branded hate speech uh, and abandoned, uh, branded abuse. Uh, on Facebook, so Facebook has said yes, yes, uh, yes, Frau Merkel, we will remove all this stuff in 24 hours. Twitter's not very much better. So what happens with, with Gregory Alan Elias? Is that somebody makes a complaint, um, he starts getting stuff from stuff from Twitter. Then the feminists turn to their next friends, which are the police. The police in Canada were in, intimately involved in, in framing the case against this guy. This is not just a case of you know the government being. Uh, complicit or turning a blind eye or, or implementing law badly, there were police officers in Canada helping feminists to put the case together against somebody to incarcerate him for laughing at them on the internet. So that's, that's the state of liberty in Canada. And this is, this is, this is you know, when, when free speech reaches so, you know, which is, is so imperiled by the outgrowth of the progressive left and by the sort of grievance culture and feelings over facts mob, the uh, social justice warriors and internet feminists, that people, that people are actually threatened with custodial sentences for disagreeing with them on the internet. And this is the most horrifying case. Now, fortunately, we did a, we did a live stream with this guy, and I think we raised about 50,000 pounds for him to, um, to help to put some of his life back together, but it's cost him about 100,000 pounds in legal fees. He was banned from using the internet for, I think, years. I think it was two years. Um, imagine that. You know, I mean, the, the left is always telling us that this is a, uh, you know, the sort of big state progressive left is always telling us that the internet is like a utility. It's like water. It's a human right. You know, it fuels the the uh, uprisings in the Middle East and it enables, it disintermediates, uh, you know, power. It enables people to connect with one another. It tears down authority structures. 